welcome to this newest round of Autoimmune Tribe Book Club. We are reading Your Body Speaks Your Mind by Deb Shapiro. I'm obsessed with this book so far. We have a lot of new people in this group, so I just want to take a quick, quick, quick moment and introduce myself. I'm Sarah Small, the creator of Autoimmune Tribe and this book club that I hope you guys have so much fun with. And I work as a health and mindset coach for women with autoimmune disease, chronic illness in general, and really, really love my work and enjoy doing it. So we're going to talk all about this book for the next, let's see, let's see how long we're going to chat about this book because we're going to do two chapters every week and it looks like there's 18 chapters. So we're going to be chatting about this book for the next two-ish months, okay? Um, this definitely was a little bit longer, uh, it was 42 pages because the introduction was there too for this first week, so hopefully that wasn't too much for you guys, um, and I haven't really checked out the length of too many of the other chapters, uh, but if it does feel like two chapters is too much, just, uh, let me know, okay? Looks like chapter three is a little bit long, so you guys let me know what your feelings are, if you feel like that was a good amount to read, if you want more if you want less, if it's just right, like Goldilocks, <laughs> okay? So, what do you guys think of the book so far? What are your initial reactions? What are your initial thoughts? Let me pull up the Facebook group. There we go, cool. No volume, okay. So, yeah. Let me know what you guys thought about the first two chapters, what you think of this book. I am kind of obsessed. I knew I would like this book and I was really excited that it won. Um, but it's like everything like that I have ever wanted my clients to read about and to know about healing in one book, which at least so far in the first two chapters, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Everyone with chronic illness needs to know all of this. Um, so it's really resonating with me and the approach I take with my clients and for myself as well. So that's really resonating. Let me know if you guys feel the same way. And let's open our books up to chapter one. And the introduction was a little bit more of, uh, it seems like that was inserted like when the book was republished or updated, right? This seems to be like an updated version uh, versus I think it was, what was it, like 1995 or six when it was first published and then 2005 when it was um, kind of readdressed. And since this new way of thinking has become a little more mainstream. So chapter one, I'm curious where, I don't know what page this is on. Page 13 slash 14, it starts on 13. And it's like the arm test. I don't think she calls it that. She calls it the effective thoughts review. And uh, it's basically where you're holding your arm out and you do like a baseline test, right? Where you have someone push down your arm and see how much give it has. Uh, and then you intentionally start to think of something really horrible, really sad, um, grief, like something that's, you know, not, so not as pleasant. And then you have that person push down on your arm again and you see if there's like a change in how much give you, you know, can handle. And uh, I first experienced that at like a intuitive healers workshop back in Michigan and the leader of the workshop had several people get up in front of the room. She tested them all the first time and then she went and she, you know, she asked them all to think about something really sad that has happened in their life uh, or that they've watched like in a movie and then she went and did it again. And it's just so cool and it's, it's cool to see their reaction because they're like, whoa, I am not trying to, you know, be weaker or to like let my arm drop down any more than it did before, yet it still happens. And that's kind of the magic of um, applied kinesiology and muscle testing that I also love to teach people about because there's so much power in tapping into the to the subconscious and being able to connect how and see how the mind and the body are connected. So have you guys ever done any of that before uh, or is this a pretty new concept to you and once you read that, were you inclined to like grab your boyfriend or your mom or <laughs> your best friend and and try it out? 
just going back and forth a lot with the comments because I have two screens open tonight. Okay, so let me know what you guys think there. And then page 16, okay, she writes, in other words, each part of part or system of your body is listening and responding to your mental chatter, your every thought and feeling. So if each part of your body is listening and responding to your thoughts, how are you going to change your thoughts? Or what shifts do you feel like you need to make in your thought process knowing that this is true, right? So if our mental chatter is that we are never going to heal, that everything, the odds are stacked against us, that um, we're never not going to have obstacles or this or that will um, always be a concern, that is what we attract, right? So she's kind of talking about law of attraction, but she doesn't call it law of attraction. Um, but she does say that our body physically is listening and responding to that mental chatter. So just scan yourself in your life right, right here for a second and ask, okay, even if I don't 100% believe that to be true, why don't I just give it a shot and take inventory of your thoughts? And that actually, it's a little bit of the homework ahead, right? Take inventory of your thoughts and ask yourself, okay, well, what thoughts are not serving my deepest level of healing? And how can I start to shift some of those thoughts into a place that is more um, compassionate towards myself? Okay, so I wanted to present that question to you guys because I think it's an important one. Um, Amy says, I struggle with changing those beliefs. Yeah, and I think that sometimes the scan makes you aware of them, but then the, the deeper work and the challenge is then shifting them, rewiring your brain, like proving to yourself that these things are not true, um, and even showing yourself how they may be benefiting you, and that's why you don't want to change them. She talks about that, I think, in the next chapter, but it's something that I've also taught in my manifesting webinar uh, about how oftentimes those beliefs that seem to be limiting have this hidden um, benefit to us. And when we can understand that, it helps us understand why we're still maybe holding on to it, why we're struggling to change it, and kind of peel back an extra layer of it. Okay. Um, page 17, okay, just the next page. All diseases have their origins in the mind. The pain that affects the physical body are secondary dise diseases. Holy crap, right? What if we all started approaching our illness or our doctors approached our illness from this perspective? Life in the medical world would shift, right? The pain that affects the body is a secondary disease, right? So there's always a root. There's always a deeper root. And what she's saying is that there's an origin in the mind. Um, and I'm really happy that then she goes into, but we are not ever always in control. So we can't blame ourselves for our thoughts, you know, having created disease, right? There's limitations to us as humans. And it's not a, an excuse or a reason for you to feel shame or guilt or responsible for the chronic illness you may experience, but instead um, a way for you to reclaim your power and say, okay, if disease orig originates <laughs> in the mind, how can I shift my perspective, right? So what question did I write here? Yeah, what if we all started thinking this way instead of shit, like this chronic ankle pain is killing me, okay? What are you gonna do about it? Normally you might say, I'm gonna ice my ankle, I'm gonna take some Advil. So instead you might ask yourself, how or where am I feeling a lack of support in my life and how can I heal that? Or how can I address that? Or how can I make myself feel more supported? right? So that's one example of how it might shift the way we approach disease if we started thinking this way. Another one is um, if you have a trouble, trouble like swallowing things, right? Like you almost, it's like hard, you feel like you're choking or like a, you have like a frog in your throat kind of all the time. Instead of being like, okay, 
I need to go see the ear, nose, and throat doctor, or you need to take some over-counter med medications, or your inhaler, or something like that, you might say or ask yourself, what in my life feels hard to swallow? Or what in my life is something that I don't really want to accept? Or what feels stuck in my life? Right? So it's a whole in different um, approach to um, seeing how disease begins or, or originates in the mind and how it manifests in our physical body. So how do you see your emotions are tied to your illness, right? And I think that's an important question for all of us to ask ourselves. How do you see how your you know, individual unique emotions may be tied to your illness? Do you guys have any ideas about that, right? And you may or and you may not, and that's okay. But I think this is a, a beautiful platform for us to start thinking about it, uh, sharing a little vulnerably. And when you guys do, it allows me to give you feedback and maybe spark something else inside of you. Amy says, I loved the part about how we are not 100% in control. It felt so empowering to read how she explained it. Yeah, she did a really good job of explaining that because I feel like I've tried to explain that before and not been so eloquent. So the truth is that we are not ever 100% in control and that we try to be and we think we are, but we are never, <laughs> right? And it's, it's um, I feel like it's almost a sense of relief, right? It's like, okay, I'm never gonna be in full, full control, so I can stop trying so freaking hard to always have that control. Makes sense? Okay. So next I wanted to... I wanted to ask you guys, um, or give you some examples of how I see that symptoms I've experienced are tied to an emotional pain, trauma, dis energetic distortion, that type of thing, okay? So, for example, a couple years ago, I had kind of this chronic, or recurring, recurring, um, left eye pain. Um, it was pain, it got my eye got really red, uh, and then I started to lose vision in my eye. Uh, so the prescription in my two eyes was always the same, and this one started to decrease, and I started to get uh, really blurry. Even when I did have my contact in, like, everything was just blurry. The contact was clean, right? And so I was really concerned that I was, like, losing sight or losing vision in this eye. It was puffy all the time, really red, really uncomfortable. And I had no idea, like, I was like, okay, I'm, I've got good eye hygiene. <laughs> and the doctors were like, yeah, you don't have any infections. You don't have pink eye or anything. Here are some steroids to put on your eye. And I just, that, I knew there was something deeper to it. And it took me a while to, while to figure out. Um, first, physically, the, the eye is connected to your liver. So that's one thing to consider. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to call my energy healer about this one and see what she has to say about, you know, your eyes and how that may be an emotional, uh, uh, physical manifestation of an emotional blockage, limiting belief, etc. right? So she was like, Sarah, you're just not seeing what you want in life. It's hard for you to see the truth. It's hard for you to grasp the truth. So it's all about seeing, right? And not seeing what you want or what you wish to be true. And the truth is hard to swallow. The truth is hard to see. And I was in a point in my life where that was very much true. Uh, it was right after my brother passed and within that first like six months. And that was just, of course, like I didn't want that to be true. And it was really hard for me to see the world now without him. And it manifested very much so in my left eye. Uh, my pain, my pain, the redness, the, the swelling is all gone now. Um, and through, interesting enough, right, both emotional and physical healing uh, modalities. So I love that she does say, yeah, there are such things as pathogens and you can catch a virus from the office, but not everyone does. And so that's an important opportunity for us to look into, okay, why did you get sick and why didn't I get sick? Where are your, um, 
what parts of you maybe are a little more sensitive or broken down uh, or vulnerable is the word I'm looking for versus me, right? Um, so that, that happened in my eye. And then I also have um, more chronic pain on my left side, okay? So I have fibromyalgia, but, and who knows, yeah, right? Like that fibromyalgia is a blanket diagnosis, so there may be a deeper root there. Still trying to figure that completely out, but I do know that I experience chronic pain. <laughs> that, that, that feels very much real, and it is mostly on the left side, and left side is your feminine side, and so I asked myself when I started to get into the emotional side of healing, okay, what about my feminine energy is in pain, and when I dug deep into it, I, I realized that I had repressed a lot of anger towards maternal energy in my life that I was just fostering and it started to fester and come to the surface because I wasn't expressing my anger or my emotions. And she talks about how anger is one of those ones that is most often repressed because societal, societally, societally, it is not as acceptable, right? So we tend to, of all emotions, repress our anger. And I very much was raised in a way that I thought being angry would get me in trouble or it was not an emotion to be expressed. So I think I've fostered that in my left side a lot. Another one for me is my knees. Uh, I, around like seventh grade, uh, developed osgood Schlatter's disease, which is pretty common. common. It's just... Uh, basically ends up being a calcium deposit on your knee, but what happens when you're little and you're growing, they say it's when you're growing too fast, that your um, your shin bone like puts tiny fractures into your uh, kneecap and then your body is intelligent and it tries to heal and protect itself and it kind of covers that space with a calcium deposit. So I have these bumps in my knees now. And again, when we start to reflect on this stuff, it's so interesting because that year, my parents got divorced, and I felt like I had to support everyone. And your knees, energetically and emotionally, represent your structurally your support system, right? And it was like I needed a, like a little band aid on that support system, uh, and because it was breaking down. I'm just gonna share one more more of mine because I hope it's starting to make you guys think a little bit. So, when I was in my early 20s around like 22 23 is probably when my digestion was the worst and it was just off right like I got bloated all the time uh, and when I look back and reflect on that part of my life it was like when I was graduating college trying to figure out who the hell am I right and because it was really hard for me to digest, physic, uh, emotionally digest, reality of life and digest like who I was, digest where do I fit into the world, that may have manifested into a physical um, digestive symptoms, right? So it was hard to digest the reality of life, where I fit in. So those are a few examples on how I have noticed that my physical symptoms have had this emotional root. Amy says, I was thinking more about the left side today while reading too. Yeah, and does she talk about it? I don't know if she talks about it, but I definitely was thinking about like, okay, where where's my pain and like how I do hold it on my left and yeah, very much related to the feminine. It could be your own feminine energy or it could be your maternal ancestry or female ancestry, right? Maternal being your mother's side of the family, female being all the females in your family, <laughs> okay? Pull my notes back up. Okay. Page 23. What did I write? <laughs> in itself, stress is neither good nor bad. It's probably hard to hear, right? <laughs> Rather, it is how we respond or react to stress creating factors that makes the difference. So this is really important for us to consider. 
And my question for all of you is, how do you react to conflict or adversity in your life? How do you react to conflict or adversity? Here are some suggestions. Maybe it provokes anxiety for you or fear, worry, stress, overwhelm, you avoid it, procrastinate, etc. Okay? If you had to pick one of those or maybe you have your own way, another word that came up for you, what would you say is the way that you most often react to adversity or conflict or stress, right, in your life? And I actually... I ask this question in my gut health consultations. Well, I don't do those anymore, but I used to do those. And I still, with new clients, will do gut health quizzes. And it helps me determine which type of leaky gut people are struggling with based on how they process their emotions. So that might be a whole new concept for some people. But the reason we're asking questions like, what is the way you respond to conflict or adversity in your life is because of this, is because the um, repressed emotions and, and stress and anger and worry and grief do manifest as these physical things. And so it helps us see, okay, of the five types of leaky gut, which one, you know, are you repressing toxic emotions? Do you have toxic gut? Do you have stress gut? Do you have gastric gut, immune gut, candida gut, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, but I was, I, it was really cool for me to be like, oh, I'm doing that in my work, and here it is here. Um, again, showing up that the way we react to stress is more important than is there stress in our life or not, because Again, just like money is neutral, it's not good or bad, but some people see it as evil, so that's the energy they've given it, versus stress is neither good or nor, nor bad, but it's how we react to it that really affects our body and our health and is the root of many, many, many diseases. I think there's a uh, statistic somewhere in this chapter about 70% of all disease being the root being stress. So how would you say you respond of to adversity or conflict of these options. Anxiety, fear, worry, stress, overwhelm, avoidance. I think I said one more. Distracting yourself or procrastinating. Jen says, <clears throat> with conflict she gets angry. When she gets stress, breaks down, whole body tickles and aches. You get freaked out. Yeah, and well, and that's like a, a perfect kind of example of what the fight or flight mode, stress mode in the body does look like, right? Um, and when it's, if you're already in a level of chronic, a low grade state of chronic stress, and then the stressor comes, it is just like that cherry on top. It's like, okay, I'm going to have a breakdown now because I was already operating up here instead of like in this balanced zone. And so since I was operating up here, that is just going to make me explode. Whoops, wrong page. So, 5.53, all right. Try to wrap this up in 30 minutes. So we got like seven more minutes to chat. Uh, page 24, have you ever had a physical pain that has come back or has been recurring for you? So that was kind of like the left eye for me, right? And have you ever considered looking at the emotional side of that recurring or recurrent pain to see if, then addressing the emotional side of it really makes it dissolve and go away forever. Uh, and I guess I already kind of told that story about how I, I was putting like steroidal drops in my eye, but then it kept, kept coming back. And then when I really started to accept my reality and see the world as it was in its truth, instead of trying to put those rose colored glasses on, um, it went away. And I've supported my liver. So again, there's like the emotional side and the physical side. Um, the reason I bring that up is something about page 24, probably that I wanted to read and I forgot. Oh, yeah. How thorough is her cure if she has a lung removed but does not change her marital circumstances, let alone inquire into the personality patterns that permitted her to cling to her long-time unhappiness? 
So yeah, you can remove your lung because you have lung cancer, but if the ca the root of the cancer is this um, persistent chronic unhappiness, it's probably just going to manifest somewhere else in your body, right? So you can remove organs all day, but it doesn't always get to the root of disease and has a lot of consequences. Have you guys ever had anything like that where you have had a pain that keeps coming back up? Amy says, yes, neck injuries. Okay, let's maybe let's dive into that for a second. Um, I don't know as much about the neck in relation to too emotional. Is it, I'm assuming it's like the back of your neck and not like around your throat area. But neck is related to uh, our, like the base of our skull and our brain holograms. Uh, and so in our brain holograms is where we store all of our past uh, memories and traumas. And so there may be something there, Amy, that especially if it's like a little bit more tar towards the top of your neck versus the base of your neck, uh, if it is up there, maybe in relation to brain hologram and past pain and memories that you're holding on in, into your, in your mind. Um, and there may be a structural structural component to it as well. Many people today have, you know, I do, forward head syndrome where we're starting to lose the curve in our neck. So something else to consider. But especially if it goes away and it comes back, what, you know, let's, let's look at the emotional side. Jen, no recurring, just autoimmune. It's on your left side. And you get headaches there at the base of your skull all the time. Yeah, definitely brain hologram. We can talk about that when we do your scan. Um, it'll show up. And then for your, if it's more on the left side of your neck too, this, that might look like I'm touching my right to you guys, but that's my left. Uh, I think this thing flips me. But it may be a memory in relation to either your feminine energy or a feminine energy in your life. Again, going back to like maternal that I was talking about. Okay. So, I'm opening the wrong page in my tab. There's a, again, starting on page 24, going into page 25, there's this little piece of homework and it's the body awareness review. And I think this is beautiful. I actually did something sort of similar to this in my self love I did a three day self love challenge fairly recently and I had everyone kind of write down and journal their in two columns their positive and negative self talk for 24 hours so that we could kind of take inventory after 24 hours and this is different but similar in that we're observing our reactions we uh, are analyzing our illness and injuries and really starting to reflect and get internal about the things that are going on instead of just kind of going in that autopilot and just saying, oh, whatever, or I'm fine, or I'll figure that out later. But taking the time to commit to be like, okay, I'm going to just take the next week or a couple of days to think about these things and really think about them and just open yourself up to what could come from, from that observation. So what I decided to do is help you guys out a little bit, and I'm going to write some uh, prompts in the group based on these two pages over the next week so that we can kind of do this together and um, share with each other and hopefully help each other out through that process as well. Okay, a couple more things. So... Let's drop some of our symptoms into the comment box. So what are some of the symptoms you guys are experiencing? Well, let me know. What? Oh man, maternal energy is a lot for me. Yeah. So interesting. I know. I'm just, I like really, really like this book. I'm excited for the next two months and just discovering. Um, yeah. Drop some of your comments into the, your, your symptoms into the comments you guys are listening to the recording later, you can do the same. But I want you guys to think about that, whether it's digestive pain, the, the um, headaches or neck pain that you described, Amy, um, Jen, for the autoimmune, where does it manifest, right? For many of us, maybe fatigue, joint pain, 
um, any sort of skin issues like eczema, psoriasis, acne, swollen eyes, um, any pain anywhere, like it could be in your, your teeth, right? Your teeth may be sensitive, but where are the symptoms in your body right now? And then your immediate homework is just to, to look at that symptom and to ask yourself, what could a deeper meaning be behind this? What is the message that my body is trying to send me through this symptom? Because it's working with me. It's trying to get your attention, right? And until we take the time to step back and reflect and ask it, okay, why are you here? We're probably not going to figure that out unless we are mindful about it and intentional and present about it. So, um, yeah, put, put your, your symptoms in the box and ask yourself, what could a deeper meaning be? And I'm happy to help you guys too. Um, I'm looking, so okay, Jen, Jen says sinus, uh, sinuses, Amy, headache, neck, shoulder, back pain, nausea, bloating, cramping, parties, bloating, Amy, and re allergic reactions. Yeah. So in parties with the the digestive stuff, it may be, I don't know if you were on a, few, a little bit ago, but I was talking about how oftentimes when it's digestion, it's like, what in our life are we having a hard time? What truth are we having a hard time digest, digesting? Or what about life feels confusing and hard to digest? And then... Um, Our back is also like our, typically, our knees can kind of be like our support system structurally, but when the, you have that back pain kind of, it's like the weight is on your shoulders. So in what way have, have in your life have you felt like you are weighted down? What's weighing you down that may be causing that back pain or like the weight of the world is on your shoulders or your back? Same with the bloating for Amy. Sinuses? I don't know. Jen, do you have any um, intuitive kind of uh, first thoughts about that? Where how you, um, why, what emotional aspect could be behind the sinuses? So I think about, you know, respiration. I think about breathing. Um, and I think about clarity. And so maybe there's kind of a congestion uh, in your head on like brain fog almost, and you're having trouble finding clarity in your life. I don't know if that resonates or not, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Digestion and acceptance is so resonating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't want to take up too much of your time, but... Okay. We didn't talk too much about Chapter 2, so I just want to touch on it for a second. Uh, first... How freaking amazing, page 32, uh, Dr. Ashley Montag, 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 author of Touching, has shown that children who do not, re do not receive enough love, who are not touched or communicated with on a regular basis can actually, excuse me, stop growing. X-rays provide evidence of periods of slower minimal bone growth corresponding to times of isolation or loneliness in the child's life. I think that is, like, amazing. I mean, it's it's like sad, right? If if there's these children who like their physical bodies aren't growing because they're not receiving love. But I think it's amazing that this has been researched and that there's a correlation between that. And it shows how important that human connection and support and tribe is to people. I teach yoga and. I think half the people come to class because they want connection, they want community, they want to breathe with other people, and they want to be assisted and touched and uh, adjusted throughout class, right? Like, who goes to yoga here? And my, if I don't get touched during the class, I'm always like, oh, I really wish someone would have touched me because I crave that in my body. I want that, that connection. I want that comfort. And when I get assisted, it always allows me to kind of relax deeper into a posture as well. So that to me is really important. And I, I thought about that when I was reading this and I was like, okay, everyone needs this connection. Everyone needs this touch. I know I'm not teaching children's yoga, but I think that even as adults, we still need this sense of connection and touch. Um, 
breathing, feeling trap congestion. Yeah, we were kind of on the same page there. Clarity, yeah. Um, so that's, I think, part of the importance of book clubs like this, um, all of these Facebook groups, right? I have my autoimmune tribe Facebook group, but there's so many other ones, uh, big and bigger and smaller, that are also out there to help support and create community around chronic illness because some of us may feel isolated, may feel alone, may feel shame, or may feel guilt, and it's just so amazing to have a place to go to to be able to let some of that off of your chest and get the support that you might be craving. So one more question to you guys is where do you find support? How do you get support in your life? Uh, are you getting support in your life or are you craving craving more than you are currently getting? I'd love for us to share any resources where we get support uh, or just personally where you're getting support in your life uh, and, and that might inspire some of us to either join those groups or reach out to people in our lives where we feel like we could be getting more support or go to yoga class where they're going to assist you so you can receive that touch and that, that loving touch uh, so that we're getting our needs met. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, one more question to ponder and you guys can comment now or later is that there were two kind of other big exercises in here that were part of, you know, homework or action items, which was the listen to your body quiz where it had a bunch of questions that to prompt you. And then also there was kind of that whole section and I think some question prompts as well on how illness may be benefiting you. And it's something I, I don't want to leave out of this conversation because uh, it may be something new that you guys haven't considered or thought of before, but I think it's important to consider, especially that's another thing I talk about in the limiting beliefs and breaking down and releasing limiting beliefs is that in order to do that, we have to understand how it might be benefiting us because usually it is. And once you kind of dive in and dissect your thought process, how Ill how could illness be helping you? And she actually gives a lot of beautiful examples that we might not think of right away because we think, oh, illness sucks, it's horrible, and that's we get in the victim mentality a little bit. But when you read some of her suggestions and ideas, it's like, oh yeah, well, like maybe this is uh, allowing my boyfriend to be more nurturing than he would normally be. Or uh, maybe this does allow me to paint and do my art every day whereas if I weren't ill I wouldn't be able to do that. So how has illness potentially benefited you and that might be something hard for you to even confront and put in front of yourself and on your plate to be like okay I'm going to be really honest with myself right now and say yeah this isn't all bad there are ways that illness may be benefiting me. It still, it still means that I have shitty days uh, but there could be, you know, some benefits. And once we realize what those benefits are, we can have a, a conversation with ourselves or your coach, your practitioner, or this group about how to show yourself that not that it's not just benefiting you and start to shift your thoughts to a place of more loving compassion and... The reality that you do want to create right because it's not a hundred percent we don't have a hundred percent control but we can control a reaction to things like stress and in that way we can shape our reality cool so I'm gonna prompt you guys throughout this week for the uh, first exercise I mentioned about just tuning in to yourself and hopefully that allows us to share and bring some stuff up and then next week we'll talk about chapters three and four and let me let me know what you guys think how we can improve these conversations I did email uh, anyone who asked for an email notifications with a reminder about tonight's call and I'm going to also send that list a recording of this call if you want to be on that list just let me know there's a link somewhere in the group but I can bring it back up to the top so that you guys are getting the notifications and the recordings especially if you can't be here 
<coughs> on Sunday nights or you're listening to the recording right now. All right. I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon.